Hi friends, Laura Live Black here from Blade and Broom, and today we're going to be talking about what it is that we mean when we say the crooked path of the traditional witch, or just crooked path, or traditional witch. We use a lot of metaphors and symbolic language when we're talking about traditional witchcraft, uh, which can be really frustrating for a lot of people, or it can be really invigorating, just sort of depending on your mindset and where you're coming from. We're talking about folkloric sources a lot of times, and we're talking about mythopoesis, and we're talking about symbol, and the way that these things are very, very multi-layered, and they reveal so much of the soul information that we're trying to unpack, and that we're trying to explore and deal with, and learn from and gain gnosis from and, and understanding of what it is to be uh, a spiritual practitioner in the particular idiom that we are. And so to, to just sort of baldly and blatantly say, here's what you do and here's how you do it, isn't what witches do in the way that we as traditional witches do it, right? So we each have our own way of doing things and we each have our own sense of the craft. Um, but if you really into sort of picking through that poetry, that symbol set, winding your way down the crooked path and figuring out um, if this imaginary garden has real toads in it, to borrow a phrase from Marianne Moore, um, then, then this might be the flavor of craft for you. So we call it the crooked path because it is a winding road. It is not straight and narrow. Um, there is not one path through the wild wood through the witch wood. There just isn't. Even if you're following a tradition, meaning something that's replicatable, that gets handed down through a lineage system, the way my path has unfolded for me is different than my initiator's path, and it's different than my students' paths are going to be. We're studying very similar materials. We're studying arguably exactly the same materials, but the way it unfolds for me is different and as I make my course through my life and study these practices and these mysteries they get revealed to me in maybe a slightly different order and maybe a slightly different way no two paths are the same we can also use the term crooked to delineate between it being a right hand path or a left hand path the path of the witch is really neither. It's not black and it's not white. Um, some witches will delineate themselves as a white witch or a black witch trying to say that their path is very positive or that their path is extraordinarily negative and, and blasting if they really focus on that cursing magic. Um, but traditional craft really isn't truly either of those things. It's not a right-hand path of pure positivity and and only working within the light, seeking to harm none and doing all of those types of things. See, and right hand path magic typically also is serving the greater good most of the time and, and seeking to serve the greater community. It's very self-sacrificing and that type of thing. Left hand path magic um, is more about taking for the self um, than it is about giving. Uh, Left-hand path magic is often viewed as very sinister, which actually just means to the left, um, but it's often viewed in this very negative light, whether it actually is or not, and uh, I know plenty of LHP practitioners that are not, you know, these negative, baneful magicians uh, in and of themselves, but, but certainly within the practice there is the opportunity to do baneful magic and blasting magic. The crooked path of the traditional witch is neither 
purely a left-hand path or a right-hand path practice, but it picks its way between the two using whatever tools it needs at the time. So, nor is it purely a middle path where it's seeking absolute balance between the two, but it's sort of going back and forth winding its way and picking and choosing its footing as it needs for the moment and frankly dealing with what the consequences may be of those choices traditional witches are very uh in tune with the idea that i'm going to make the choice that i have to make at the time with the best information that i have and if there are consequences for me for that action then i will deal with the consequences we also generally then really look at what the consequences are going to be ahead of time before we make the choice. We actually do quite a lot of soul searching about what our ethics truly and deeply involve. We'll talk in more depth about traditional witchcraft ethics in another video because it definitely deserves its own discussion. For now, we'll leave it at saying that the threefold law and the concept of harming none are really sort of foreign concepts within traditional witchcraft. They're, they're not principles to which the traditional witch typically adheres. Um, our codes of ethics tend to be a lot more complicated than that, actually. So a lot of times it's easier for us to actually juxtapose traditional witchcraft against Wicca as a way to describe what traditional witchcraft is and what it isn't. And the reason for that is that Wicca is so much more broadly understood within paganism and within the witchcraft community. Um, most people have done some reading about Wicca and have had some exposure to Wicca because it is has been very broadly popularized and, and most people get their first exposure to witchcraft through Wicca, as opposed to traditional witchcraft. Wicca stems from the 1950s with the writings and publications of Gerald Gardner. It is very goddess-based and the central authority within uh, a Wiccan coven is the High Priestess. There are lots of derivatives of Wicca so the first sort of hive off of Wicca was, of Gardnerian Wicca, was the Alexandrian tradition. And then from there, there have been lots and lots and lots of other variations of Wicca that have come from that. And a lot of folks don't necessarily realize how they have, how the tradition of witchcraft that they're practicing has evolved from Wicca. But... If you start studying the roots of the practice of witchcraft that you are practicing, if it is very ceremonial in nature, very goddess focused or has the goddess as its central image, um, very priestess focused, then it is probably a, a neo-Wiccan tradition. Um, if you are accustomed to um, four elements uh, in the four quarters with north being air, east being fire, right? Hold on. <laughs> now earth. Oh my gosh. So that's why it's so different for me, right? So earth, air, fire, water. Um, yeah, that's how different it is. <laughs> People are going to watch this video and think, she doesn't even know her elements. Tradcraft can be really different. Our elements are very spirit-driven and um, are in sometimes very, very different places. So I am very familiar, like I am very familiar with where the, uh, where the ceremonial hermetic elements are. Um, you know, I have a good grounding and educational background in that, but we come at it in Tradcraft very often from a, a very different perspective. So, so that's another note, right, is that in Wicca, um, 
there's a lot of ceremonialism, what I would call Western Hermeticism, um, just woven throughout the magical practices and, um, and even within the mystery system that is, that is Wicca and, was, and is within the Neo-Wiccan versions of witchcraft. And it's also usually very initiatory and also hierarchical. So you have this structure, usually a three degree structure. You can find some of that um, initiatory and hierarchical structure within versions of tradcraft. We are like cats in that sense, that we do whatever we want, um, and that each little group, each family grouping within tradcraft can be kind of different. Some of us are more comfortable within initiatory settings, and some of us are more comfortable within hierarchical settings. We like knowing who's in charge, and we like having um, some of that. But some of us are also very egalitarian and we like just sort of like taking turns <laughs> with being in charge. We like, um, you know, taking it in rotations. Um, we don't have that centralized authority and, and so it can be very, very different depending on which group you're looking at. Um, sort of once you see beyond that, that curtain of mystery and you get to see how covens are working. Um, we can all look radically different. So we're going to just sort of set that part aside and then look at what's happening within the magic and what's happening um, within that structure. So as opposed to being rooted in that hermetic and ceremonial magical system, tradcraft instead is based in shamanism, usually European shamanism. Um, some are more Northern European shamanism and some are more Southern European shamanism, but a lot of them are actually based in Northern European and especially like British, what became British practices. Um, so you're looking at Northern European Germanic Celtic practices. Um, that then sort of got filtered over to the British Isles and then sort of became condensed into um, British witchcraft. But that's not always the case. And again, you'll find some traditional witchcraft covens that have other influences because they have members that come from other places and are bringing their traditional practices with them. One of the interesting things that you'll find, and this is kind of just a notation, but you'll find that we often refer to ourselves along family names. So we call ourselves the family quite a lot. You'll hear us say things like the people or um, terms like the clan. So for instance, uh, a really famous group is the clan of Tubal Cain, um, which was Robert Cochran's working group. So that's kind of a notable thing, and partially because that was who was teaching each other back in the day. You would learn from somebody in your family, and it would get passed along family lines. And there is part of the lore is that witchcraft gets passed down through the blood. And so even though we're not necessarily only passing it, along family lines anymore. It's often this idea that we're adopting you into the family of the craft. And then so very often the oaths are blood oaths. And it's this idea that, that we share the blood and we share blood of the, of those primordial beings who gave us witchcraft in the first place. Our practices, when I say that they're very shamanic based, they're usually based on trance and um, flying out or what is referred to in other traditions, more new age traditions as astral projection, but it's based on journey work and on spirit communication and on healing practices and that type of work. So things that across world cultures look like shamanism. <laughs> um, we tend to be more animistic in our practices um, seeing life and spirit everywhere um, and seeking to find gnosis within that and interact 
within that. The tools of traditional witchcraft are strikingly different from those that you'll find in Wicca. So you'll see things like the broom and the cauldron in both, and everybody has sort of an array of cups and blades. Um, everybody likes their knives <laughs> and swords, but uh, but I think this the shamanic influences that are in traditional witchcraft lend to um, some really distinctly unique tools that you're not going to find from the hermetic influences that you'll see in Wicca. So we have things like anvils and stangs and druzy stones and keppins and stuff that if you're not familiar with them already, those probably, a lot of that's just gonna sound like foreign words that I'm saying, and they're not foreign words. They're actually just very European words. <laughs> um, you know, anvil's not a foreign word. You're, I'm, you know what an anvil is, but you're probably also thinking, how in the world are you using an anvil in your witchcraft? Um, and again, we'll talk about that, but <laughs> not today. I mentioned that Wicca has the goddess and priestesshood as very sort of centralized and takes an upper priority. Um, and you see the god and you see priests within Wicca, but usually the goddess and the priestess have the final say. They And it's the god is the goddess's consort and the priest is deflecting or deferring to the priestess. That's typically how it is within most of Wicca. Within tradcraft, this can vary by specific tradition or coven, um, but you'll find one of really three scenarios happening. Either there's a balance, a very equal balance between those masculine mysteries and the feminine mysteries and the deities that represent them. So you find power shared between the divine masculine and the divine feminine. Or you'll find that there's a lot of reverence given to a figure that's identified as the witch father who is seen as that bringer of enlightenment and uh, the illuminator. Um, and he's very, he's a very devilish figure. He looks very much like the Christian devil. Um, and there's a lot less emphasis placed on any type of goddess figure. Or, as a third option, you'll see a lot less emphasis placed on any kind of deity figures and a lot more emphasis placed on tutelary spirits and spirit communication um, and that sort of familiar spirit relationship. And, and there's just not as much focus on deity within those versions of traditional craft at all. So really it just sort of depends on where the focus is within that particular branch of traditional craft. One final thought is that you find a lot of folkloric references and inspiration within traditional craft. Some traditions more than others. So, and I'll just go ahead and say very heartily that my own tradition is very heavily folkloric. And when I say folkloric, I mean that we're looking to folklore, we're looking to myth, we're looking to nursery rhymes and... Um, chants and balladry and trial records and that type of source material for inspiration and for hints and clues about about magic and about deity and about spirit and about about our path and about how we might journey deeper into this into this crooked path and into the spiral. One of the symbols that I actually quite like as an emblem of the crooked path, one that my tradition uses as an emblem of the crooked path, is the triskel. So we use it actually um, as a reference for the crooked path and, and see the crooked path as synonymous with the spiral castle itself. And the spiral castle then being synonymous with with the world tree and with 
and the world tree as being um, that transvective center, that place from which we can travel out by accessing by accessing the crooked path and by setting our feet upon the crooked path, as it were, we can access all parts of our inner world and all parts of the multiverse, all parts of those outer realms and inner realms and all of the realms that one could possibly imagine in order to have the most full and complete understanding of who we are, which is the work of witches, ultimately, I think. So I hope that this has been informative for you and enlightening. <laughs> um, I'm sure that it may be leaving you with as many questions as it's giving you answers. And I would love to be able to engage with you in the comments about those questions. Uh, there will be more videos, of course, forthcoming every Monday at noon. Share, subscribe, comment, like, do all the things. As always, check out the links down below. And I will see you soon. Bye, guys.